went to the 70s night. It was 70s night music and 70 year olds. And I've never been hit on by so many 70 year olds in my life. Uh, I'm not kidding. I, we stayed in the back and, and I was, I was getting it. I was enjoying myself. Keep it here. You know, you know, they got pizza there. You don't have to, you don't have to make the pizza or any of those kinds of things. But, uh, I'll tell you what, they would come up behind us and they'd be like, you guys should go out there. You guys should go. Out. And, and, uh, I wasn't going out there because we would have stuck out like a sore thumb. Um, uh, and then Crystal came and she said to me, uh, I have to get my game on because all these ladies are hitting on you and it's not going to work out for me. So uh, we, we really did have a great time and I, I'm really glad to be back. And today is the uh, uh, general 35th anniversary of Grace Community Church. It wasn't actually on September 24th, but uh, it's, it's around this time. Uh, today is uh, the day after, actually the 23rd, uh, was the day that Crystal and I were appointed as the senior pastors. So we thought, what better way to come back than to celebrate all of the goodness of the Lord, all that he's done in the history of this church and uh, in our lives. And, and we're going to do that in just a little bit. Uh, at the, near the end of the service, we're going to talk about that, and we're going to enjoy a meal together. As my wife has already said, please stay for lunch. If you had no idea we were having lunch today, we knew you'd be here. We knew there would be people that would come and, and wouldn't know, and we have extra food, and we want you to stay and eat. Um, it's real casual and friendly, and we just want to fellowship with you. So I am ready to preach. Now, I'm not going to preach four weeks of messages today. You don't have to worry about that. Um, but I am going to start a new series, and, and the series I'm going to call it uh, is We Are Family. And it's a good 70s song, too. We are family. Oh, I, got all, I got all my sisters and me, except I got three brothers too, so I don't know where they fit in that song, but um, we are family. Uh, it was in April uh, this year when I received an email from uh, David Coffey, our district supervisor. By the way, Crystal invited you to come to the fall conference on Wednesday. Uh, this week, I'm not sure which night it is, they're actually introducing our new supervisor uh, for, the, for, for our district, and uh, it's going to be one of the evenings. I'm, I'm un, unaware of which evening it is. But you are welcome to come and join us for the evening services at the, at the Dallas uh, Sheraton. Um, but it was uh, our, our current district supervisor, David Coffey, uh, emailed me. Actually, he called me and said, hey, uh, are you interested in going to uh, some meetings in June? Uh, I need to know by the end of the week. It was kind of last minute. And uh, the, the, the National Church Office had asked for each district to send two representatives to uh, these meetings. And I'm, I'm pretty sure because of the, the late notice, everybody else said no, and he was, he was getting to me. Uh, Weiss, you know, W was down in the, in the Rolodex, and uh, he got to me, and, and I, I called Crystal, and I said, hey, do you want me to go to these meetings? And um, she said, yeah, I think you should go. Uh, it, was, uh, it was hosted by a group called Blessed Earth. And uh, where you stand on being green and global warming and all of those things uh, is a conversation I don't want to have with you. Um, <laughs> but I thought that's kind of what I was getting into with the organization's name, Blessed Earth. Uh, and, and it turned out to be about Sabbath and Sabbath rest. And it would require me to go to California by myself. Crystal wasn't able to join. Uh, and I really did want to decline, but, but she told me I needed to go. So uh, being super spiritual, I went and asked Leo if I should go. <laughs> because uh, it happened to be the same week of VBS. And so I was like, you know, are you really going to be okay if I'm, if I'm not here for VBS? Hoping he would say, no, I need you here, Pastor Ben. I, I knew he was going to say that he needed me here. And instead he said, no, actually it'd be better if you're gone because then you won't know what I'm doing. <laughs> so I, I, uh, I called David and I, uh, I told him that I would go. And I flew out to California uh, leaving my family with a bad attitude. Uh, and I've found, and, and Crystal reminded me, that these are the moments, these are the meetings where the, the Holy Spirit really typically does something in me. The ones that I really just kind of fight against, and I, I do everything I can to not get there. And uh, I got on the plane, and I kind of made the decision, I'm going to go, and I'm going to have a good attitude. And then I, I walked into our room for the, for the three days and two nights, and I use that word room loosely because I've been in closets that are bigger uh, than the room. And it was our room. Uh, there was four of us in this, in this room. And now my bad attitude has returned. Um, 
at this point, I'm, I'm thinking that the best thing that's going to come out of this trip is I had to buy a new flashlight. Um, I had to buy this new flashlight. It's really bright. I won't shine in anybody's eyes. And it extends. And it does that really cool feature. And it's uh, magnetic, which I think is really cool. I'm going to leave it right here so you can just stare at that instead of me for the rest of the service. Uh, but I was thinking this is going to be the best thing that comes out of this trip because I found out that not only were we staying in a room, it really was. There was a single bed pressed up against the wall. There was two feet between them and then another single bed. And that was the room. And then there was a little hallway that was about uh, three feet wide and, the, and then two more beds just like that. Um, we had to then walk from those dorms. I don't know what you would call it. It was a YMCA camp. Uh, we had to walk from there to where our meetings were, which was a half mile or three quarters of a mile through the woods. Like we couldn't drive our cars and park them there. We had to walk. So that's why I had to get a new flashlight. I, didn't have a, I couldn't find a flashlight. So I'm thinking this is going to be the best thing that comes out of this, uh, this trip. Can you, can you feel my good attitude here? Anybody? I mean, can you sense how excited I am to be here? We show up at uh, dinner, and actually the first thing the leader says is, I'm sorry for your accommodations. And I'm just like, how did you not know where we were going to be staying? We're in the middle of Los Angeles. We're, we are like two miles total, like down the street and up the hill from Santa Monica Pier. We are like in the middle of civilization. How in the world do you even find a place like this in the middle of L.A.? You have to work to do that. They found it. So how did the meetings go, Pastor Ben? Uh, honestly, uh, I have mixed reviews about the meetings, but the Lord spoke to me deeply. And uh, I know Crystal was praying that I would have an encounter. Uh, and as always, he answers her prayers. Uh, <laughs> to give up three days, at miss VBS, and most importantly, be away from the family was not, it is not, and it never is on my top list of things to do. But I had that moment, that moment where you know the Lord is speaking directly to you. Of course, when I returned, I didn't say anything to Crystal because I wasn't going to give her the satisfaction of knowing she was right. Um, and it was about, I don't know, four or five days after I got back that we kind of sat down and had a conversation. And uh, actually, she found out through counseling somebody else. We, we ended up... Uh, uh, having some youth pastors in from around the district and we were talking about camp stuff and, and we finished the meeting and they left and they said, hey, can we talk to you for a minute? And what was just inside of me just began coming out. And I'm apologizing to Crystal the entire time because she hadn't even heard the things that I was saying. And I want to talk to you this morning about what the Lord was saying to me. If you want to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 11, we're going to read uh, five verses there, uh, starting in verse 25. And it says this, uh, I'm, it'll be on the screen as well. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. <clears throat> that passage of scripture is a, a very familiar passage of scripture. Probably you've heard uh, pastors, teachers, preachers, whatever you want to call them, uh, podcasts have been talked about this passage of Scripture. And if you are familiar with it, you would know Jesus is talking to the religious leaders of the day. He's talking to them and he's, he's basically telling them and everybody who's listening, look, their way, their pathway to salvation doesn't work. It doesn't work. The, the yoke that they have placed on you, the burden that they're placing on you through having to fulfill this law and the laws that they have added to what the Lord said isn't going to work. So take on my yoke because my yoke is easy and, and my burden is light. He is addressing the Jewish believers as well as uh, the Jewish leadership there. And they weren't real happy about it. However, 
In verse 27, we see the deity of Jesus and his place in the Godhead. He says, me and my Father. In verse 28, we see really the first call to a general call of salvation. Come to me, all, all you who labor. It's kind of the first time in Scripture that we see that 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 general calling. Everybody is welcome. It's not just for the specific 144,000 or it's not just specific to a people group. It's come to me all who labor. In verse 29, we see the heart and the intent of relationship with the Lord and what grace and mercy could be if embraced. He says, for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest. And then in verse 30, we see what life will be like once we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. So there's three basic commands here. Come to him, take his yoke, and learn from him. That's, that's narrowing it down very simple. That's what he says. And here's what we learn about Jesus from this. He's going to give us rest. He's humble and he's not going to force himself on anyone. He says, come to me. He doesn't say, you are coming to me. That's later, right? Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But here he's saying, come to me. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. So the speaker, our, our speaker for uh, the event, has, uh, they had two. One was uh, Pastor A.J. Swoboda. Uh, he's a four-square pastor out of the Northwest. And then another by the name of Matthew Sleeth. And Matthew Sleeth wrote this book, 24-6. Um, I highly recommend it. It's a really great book. I don't, I don't know that I recommend books very often. Uh, you have to be able to read to recommend books. And um, uh, whew, phew, real quick. Uh, actually, the, the, this organization is Blessed Earth, and one of their speakers is going to be the speaker at our marriage conference. Uh, so his name is Bill Hughes. I haven't personally met Bill, but this organization and this topic and this group is really, I, I'm really impressed with them, and I really want to encourage you, if you're able to join us, please join us for this marriage retreat. Preston's going to be, Preston McReynolds is going to be leading worship, and Bill Hughes is going to be the speaker talking about resting in the Lord and how that affects our marriage. And uh, none of you have to work. We are, we are going to be poured into and not to, like the worship team doesn't have to come and do worship. I, I'm not speaking. We're just coming to rest in the Lord and to hear what God has to say about that. But the speaker says this about uh, verse 30, from, and this is from his commentary. There's relationship with Christ, relief from p- f- fatigue, relief from heavy burdens. The soul rests forever. Truth, wisdom, and knowledge, when it says learn of me, an easy yoke and a light burden. We keep saying that. I quickly evaluated my own life and I realized that was not how I was living. I was not resting in the Lord. In fact, I don't know even today that I know how to rest in the Lord if I'm completely transparent. Resting in the Lord is different than taking a day off. I I have a day off, a, a supposed day away from work a supposed day where I don't have to come and punch in and and sit at the desk. I can do what I would like to do, but I wasn't resting in the Lord. I was just getting my own stuff done. I was just taking a day off. If you continue to read in Matthew, you see that chapter 12 immediately begins after that, but it's not a new thought or a new conversation. It's a continuation of what Jesus was saying. In the first 13 verses, Jesus explains how all of this wonderful stuff can happen. I'm going to read just three verses, and starting in verse 6. It says, Yet I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple. But if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. His yoke is easy and his burden is light was directly relating to two things. The first, I've already said, the security of our salvation. When we enter into a relationship with the Lord, our salvation is secure, and we don't have to labor for it. We can't earn our salvation. You can't be good enough. You can't be smart enough. You can't do enough good deeds. It is only because it is. Because Jesus said, I will leave heaven. I will come to this earth. I will live this sinless life and willingly sacrifice myself I will go and conquer death, hell, and the grave, and I will rise from the dead and ascend to heaven, and that's why we have salvation. You cannot earn it. And so the security of your salvation is based in the faith that you have that Jesus Christ indeed did these things for you. The confession of the the Lord as your Savior, the confession of your sins and the repentance, and it's done. The second thing is I believe there's a physical rest 
which typically takes place by honoring the Sabbath. And I think both of those things are in effect here. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time this morning or even in this series talking about the security of our salvation. I think that's something that uh, uh, believers in, a, in this church and, and believers who spend any time walking with the Lord should be secure in. And if you're not, I'd love to have a, a personal conversation with you about that. I don't think it needs to come from the pulpit right now. What I want to talk about is the physical rest which happens from honoring the Sabbath. And there are people in this room who have very deep and I would suggest even biblical views about what day is the Sabbath. And I'm not going to choose to persuade you as to what day is the Sabbath. There is the Lord's Day, which we call Sunday. Some people call that the Sabbath. There is Friday night to Saturday, which is the, how the Jews observe Sabbath. What I'm suggesting is Take a moment. I don't want to get into a debate. I don't want to get into an argument. What I want to suggest is there's a moment where we should step back from our normal rhythms and routines and honor the Lord with our time. And if you want to debate Friday night to Saturday, Saturday to Sunday, Sunday to Monday, if you want to tell me, hey, my work schedule won't allow it, I've got to do it on Tuesday, I'm going to be fine with that. That's, again, not what this topic of conversation is about. It's about entering into this place where we set aside everything to honor the Lord. So there was four takeaways from these meetings. The first is there was something missing from my life and the life of my family. And I don't know how many of us will take a moment to step back and actually recognize or evaluate or suggest maybe there could be something missing from our life. The second was I wasn't walking in the promise of the Lord and yet I was in relationship with Him. And I think you should know the difference. You can walk with the Lord you can be in relationship with the Lord and not be in the center of his blessing, not be in the place where his blessing is being poured out. If there's specific commands in Scripture that you're not choosing to engage in, you cannot be in the middle of his blessing but still be in relationship with the Lord. I was not in the middle of the blessing when it came to resting in the Lord. And I, I, am, I am not proud of that. I am not suggesting I have it all figured out. But what I am suggesting is I'm working on it. And once I came to the revelation that maybe some things needed to change, I wanted to begin making those changes. His yoke wasn't easy and his burden wasn't light. If I were to do a show of hands and I'm not, how many of you would say in your own personal life right now, if I were to say, is your walk with the Lord easy? Is the, is the yoke easy? Is the burden light? I wonder how many people would raise their hands. I wonder how many people would raise their hands if I said, is it difficult? Have we turned it into something that is hard? Have we turned it into something that is a bunch of do's and don'ts instead of walking in relationship with God the Father and Jesus Christ the Son and being filled with the Holy Spirit and empowered by all that Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit wants to do in us? I realized, thirdly, that something was going to have to change and it would begin with honoring the Sabbath or the Lord's Day. Again, I don't want to get into the, the debate of that language. And I believe, fourthly, that there are promised blessings that will be rewards of that obedience. When I finally humbled myself enough to have the conversation with Crystal, I explained I felt like the Lord was asking us to make significant changes to our weekly schedule. And it would cost us time. It would cost us income. It would cost us energy. But I believed in the short term and in the long term, there would be significant blessings. So the last Sunday of June, Crystal and I made some changes, and this is the first time I'm really talking about this in the pulpit because how many people go to meetings or go to conferences or go to uh, some place, you hear a podcast, and you say, I'm going to make all these changes, and you do it for a week, and then it's like you're done, and you don't follow through, right? So we're three months, four months into this now. It's become a rhythm. It's become a routine. I feel confident it's going to continue, so I'm comfortable talking about it now. The changes we made are really the foundation for this series. It's where I want to see us go as a church family. When I was um, talking with Crystal, I said that we need to learn to rest in the Lord, and Sunday needs to be different than every other day of the week. And so I'm going to quickly read through some of these things. I, I want to suggest to you, this is how we're doing it. I'm not telling you to do what we're doing. Everybody hear me say this is just a, a practical application in Ben and Crystal's house. 
This is not how the Guidos are supposed to do it. It's not how the Steins are supposed to do it. You have to talk to the Lord and figure out what this looks like in your home and with your family. But here's what the Lord said to us. We're not going to work on Sundays any longer. Now, I'm preaching, right? This is part of my job. But this is not, this is not like, this is not work. The work comes in advance in the preparation. The delivery of the message is significant and it's important, but it's not like this big, huge, draining thing in my life. And we've made the decision, Sundays are going to be different than every other day of the week. So when we get home, our phones get put away. Not just ours, but our kids' phones. And we're not on the phone any longer. In fact, some of you have uh, called and I've not called you back till Monday. Some of you have texted and I've not responded until Monday. And you maybe thought I was mad at you. <clears throat> I'm not. We've just made some changes in our home. Email gets put aside. It can wait till Monday. Social media is shut down. I've told our kids all homework has to be done by the end of the day Saturday. We're not going to do homework on Sundays. Mom's not going to be grading your papers on Sunday. We do the co-op, and so there's a, a significant involvement from mom when it comes to uh, school. All that's going to be done by the end of the day on Saturday. Uh, all, all cleaning's going to be done by the end of the day on Saturday things that have to be ready for school. We do our best to even get our clothes out for school on Saturday instead of taking the time Sunday night to go find them and iron them. And look, I, I know this is extra work, but it's preparation in order to get to the place where we can rest. We are going to do whatever we can to take a nap on Sundays, if at all possible. And then here's the biggest change, and this is what we're going to talk about as we, as we move forward. We have a large family dinner now on Sunday evenings. It's a mandatory meal for my children. They don't have a choice. I've told them they can't work on Sunday evenings. Uh, it's easy for Justice because he works at Chick-fil-A, uh, so he doesn't have to worry about it. But my daughter was working at a job where she had to go and tell them I can't work on Sundays, uh, Sundays any longer because she would go to church during the day and then when after lunch she would go and it's a retail job. She'd go work for a couple hours. I said, on Sundays from now on, we're going to have this meal together. The kids are allowed to invite a friend, but only one friend. We're not inviting the entire neighborhood to join us. Um, our extended family is invited, so uh, that's a large uh, family. We have 27 just on the wife's side, um, and then my wife's side of the family as well. We've invited everybody to come every week. They're welcome to come. Uh, dinner starts at 6. We're starting at 6, and I don't care if you're there or not. Uh, we're going to start eating at 6. We have specific conversation that we have around the table every week. And so there are three questions. Everybody knows they're going to get asked. Uh, the three questions are, what was your greatest challenge this last week? And we just go around the table. What was your greatest challenge this last week? And then we go around the table and say, what was your greatest victory or your greatest joy this last week? And then the third question is, what do you think your greatest challenge is going to be in this coming week? Because we all have things that we, we, we know about that are coming towards us and, and they create anxiety or they create fear or we know it's going to be a challenge. And so we want to pray for those things and then we, we pray. And then we have dessert every week. Uh, we don't do soda and dessert in our house every night, uh, but on Sundays we have soda and we have dessert and it's as much as you want. There's not, there's not rules on, uh, on what you can have and what you can't have. When it's gone, it's gone. But... We wanted it to be a sweet place that our kids wanted to be part of. We, don't, we, we want it to be different. It's not like every other night. We made the choice to take off our Fitbits. I got that nice tan line there. Um, our Fitbits control our lives. I don't know about you, but they control my life. They control my wife's life. We have to get enough steps. So we're going to go walk even though we're exhausted because we don't have enough steps. Or I can't eat that thing because I haven't got enough steps. So I'm going to take these steps so I can eat this thing. No, I've just made the decision that, that it's a great tool and I use it six of the days, but on the seventh day, I'm not using it any longer. I've just made the decision. I'm not going to be controlled by that. On Sunday, we're going to enjoy our lunch. We're going to enjoy our dinner. And on Monday, we'll start again. Does it slow down the process? Sure. It means you're not going to lose weight as quickly may mean you don't get as much muscle as quickly, but you know what? There's a freedom that's come with that for us anyways. Uh, we don't clean up. We just move the dirty dishes to the counter or to the sink. Uh, we're not going to spend the entire night doing all the dishes. We do our best to eat on paper plates uh, if possible to help with that. 
but all the pots and all the pans and all that stuff gets just put in. We'll do it Monday. Everything can wait till Monday. Most of the things in your life can be set on hold in order to honor the Lord in something. But too often we let the tyranny of the, of the present dictate what we're going to do instead of dictating to the present what we're going to do. We watch a movie or play games. We do something as a family together. And before you begin to judge what we're doing and think about how that will never work in your family schedule, I just want to say this is what we chose to do. You don't have to do it that way. Resting on the Sabbath is not just about not doing work. So at the, at the meetings, one of the questions that was asked was, tell us what we can't do. Like, tell me I can't mow the lawn. Tell me I can't, and, and that's not what it's about. If it becomes about the don'ts, then the do's don't matter. Which is why we've just made it about, we're going to spend time together. I'll be honest, I had no idea how Crystal would feel about these changes. I committed to cooking the meals. Most of the meal prep is done on Saturday. Our, our, our meal for tonight is already prepped and ready to go. Uh, I've got to put it onto the stove and that's it. It's, it's, we're having chicken tacos at our house tonight and uh, I'll make some rice this afternoon. Uh, but most of the meal prep is done on Saturdays uh, so that I'm not spending all afternoon cooking. I had no idea what my kids would feel about it, but I didn't care. Just being honest. And I had no idea if any of the extended family would even want to come, and I didn't care about that either because it wasn't for them. It was just an invitation to them. So as I, as I began making these changes, I, I've been in a, a pastoral coaching uh, relationship for the last, I don't know, two months or three months, and I was telling him about this, and he said, well, why did you do this? Why did you make these changes? Now, I, I know I've, I've set this up, and, and I promise we're, we're bringing this to a close in just a few minutes. The reason why I made these changes, I quickly said to him, I didn't even think about it, which was surprising to me. Because I want to honor. I want to honor my parents. Uh, they gave up family and friends to follow Christ. And my life and my family are changed forever as a result. And I want to honor them. It's biblical. I want to create a sweet place for my wife and my kids. I want to create a place where my kids want to be there. They want to come. They, it's not, the Lord did not promise this next statement to me, but he kind of gave me a picture of 10, 15, 20 years down the road that my kids and their spouses and my grandkids will be coming to my home at 6 p.m. on Sundays. It's not a promise from the Lord. Understand the difference. He didn't say that will be happening, but he gave me some a, a picture of what could be. And whatever the first grandkid begins to call me, right? Because the first grandkid names the grandparents, whether you like it or not. Whatever I get named, my hope is I'm going to have my whole family sitting around my table on Sunday evenings. And my grandkids are going to be saying, when's dessert? Whatever they call me. I want it to be a place where there's rest in the Lord. One of the things we're going to talk about is we're supposed to give rest. When I said I didn't care what my kids had to say about it, it's because I am going to give them rest. Because sometimes you have the power to give people rest. And there's a biblical blessing in that if you study scripture. And so I'm going to give my kids rest even if they don't understand it. I want fellowship with family and friends. I want to be a place where invitation is given. Invitation to the pre-saved. I want to actually have a meal together. I want to strengthen the weak places and celebrate the strengths. I want to create a safe place. I want to model what prayer does, how it changes things. So I finished saying all of this to the pastoral coach and he said, how do I get to become part of your family? I want to come to your home on Sunday nights. And I, I realized that's what we're supposed to be as a church family. All of those things that I just talked about have nothing to do with a gathering place on an evening. Yes, that is happening in my family, and I hope 
that you take some of these things and say, I can do that and I can do that, but maybe it'll look like this. But really, as a church family, we should be a place where we honor one another. We should be a place that is sweet, that we want to come to, that we want to be part of. This should be a place where we rest in the Lord. This should be a place where we're able to give rest to those who are tired and weary. This should be a place where we fellowship as family. It should be a place where invitation is given to the pre-saved. We should be able to say to our family and our friends that don't know the Lord yet, come with me to church. It's a safe place. Come with me to church and find out what it is that a family can look like. We should have meals together. I'm, I'm really glad that we get to do this this afternoon. We should be a place where we strengthen the weak places. I mean, let's, Hebrews declares there's a sin that so easily entangles all of us. We all have struggle. This should be a place where we can come and we can strengthen our weak places. This should be a place where we celebrate our strengths. Celebrating what Guido and, and, and the train uh, uh, venture that they just did. I want to celebrate that. That's a strength. Guido's really good at neighboring. It's just natural to him. It's not effort. It's not work. He just does it. We need to celebrate things like that. We need to celebrate big things and little things. This should be a safe place. I'm not sure that I would suggest that it is a safe place all the time. And this isn't like a, a rebuke. Don't, don't hear that. What I know is people can be mean. What I know is there are times we just miss it. We had a bad week. Hurt people hurt people. This should be a place that when we walk into this building is a safe place. This should be a, a place where prayer matters and we take things to the Lord. And I recognize that for the last 18 months, we've been challenging every week, love God and love people. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the commandments, all the laws and the prophets are wrapped up in that. I also recognize that a church, and specifically Grace Community Church, needs to be a family, a strong family, a loving family, a close-knit family. We need to function as a family. We, we, we are called to live our lives aware of what God is doing in us. We are called to live our lives aware of what God is doing through us. But we also need to focus on each other because after all, you're my neighbor too, right? So I looked at the changes we made and I, and I decided, I felt like the Lord was speaking to me, this is what we need to do here. And so we are family. The, the remainder of the year, the sermon series is going to be about these topics, honor, a sweet place, rest, giving rest, fellowship happening, in invitation, a place to gather around food, strengthening the weak places, celebrating the, the strengths, being, being a, a safe place and, and being a, a family that prays. Now, uh, we're going to receive communion here in just a second. And actually, if our, if our ushers could go ahead and, and uh, make their way back and, and actually go ahead and begin to serve the congregation. When you read 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and this won't be on the screen, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27, uh, it's a call to examine yourself before you receive communion. Uh, go, you, can, you can go ahead and begin serving communion. It says, Therefore, whoever eats the bre this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats, thank you, For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Now that's, a, that's a, a call to address sin in our lives, right? That's what that call is. It's a, it's a Lord, for 30 seconds, I want to just examine, are there, are there things in my life that need to change? Do I, do I need to change something in my relationship with my wife? Do I need to change something in my relationship with my kids? Is there sin that is known or is there secret sin that needs to be addressed? I would suggest to you that oftentimes when we receive communion, we don't go through the examination process. I spent the last 
four weeks going through an examination process, to be completely honest with you. An examination process on calling. An examination process on my relationship with my wife. An examination process on how I'm teaching and training and releasing my children. That's really hard. For those of you who've done it, you know what I'm talking about. For those of you who haven't, good luck. (laughs) It's difficult. I, I didn't realize how difficult it would be to release your children to be the adults that we've been raising them and training them to be. It's like we put all this effort into, we want you to be who God's called you to be, and when it's time to go, we're like, yeah, no, don't go. It doesn't make sense. It's counterintuitive. My kids are good kids. Today's Justice's 18th birthday. I guess now he's a man, right? Today's also Isaac's birthday. How old are you, Isaac? 16. We got two staff kids' birthdays today. That's pretty cool. I don't know how you guys worked that out. Mark? No, it's $5. Yeah, I'm, I'm working it into his birthday present. That's what he's going to get, $5. Uh. I, uh, I've gone, I, I read through the New Testament. I told you I was going to read through the New Testament. I read through the New Testament over this four weeks and the things that popped out was rest in the Lord. Rest in the Lord. And I don't, I don't know how to do that. I am a goer. I will go anywhere. I will do anything. If you give me a list, I'll knock it out of the park. I'm not very creative but I'm a planner. I can copy creative, <laughs> but I can't, I'm not very good at creating. And I, I, spent, I spent time examining what do I need to do to come to a place where I'm in, I'm in the place of blessing. God's blessing, right? We're going to celebrate some of those blessings in just a moment. But I know he's called me to live my life different. And it's difficult. If you're going to commit to taking a day to rest in the Lord, let me just tell you, all hell will break loose against you when you do that. That's not a joke. I'm not trying to be funny. I realize it is funny. We took time. The second day, Crystal's phone was stolen. The third day, we did, had this. and we, I mean, we had challenge after challenge. Because the enemy doesn't want you to rest in him. If you study in scripture where Jesus did things on the Sabbath, actual demonic activity took place as a result of Jesus doing what really was meant to be on the Sabbath, which was empowering his love and his rest, his healing. Demonic activity took place. So let me be honest with you. As you are preparing to receive communion, I'm going to ask you in just a second, How many of you would suggest maybe you need to learn how to rest in the Lord a little differently? Maybe your homes need to learn how to rest in the Lord a little differently. What I, the the biggest conclusion I came to, and now this is kind of more personal than it is like message, but here's what here's what I took away from from the four weeks. I can no longer let schedule dictate to me what my life is going to look like. When we came to Grace on August 1st of 2004, I wasn't healthy. I would suggest that uh, our marriage was okay because we didn't know any better. I would suggest our family was okay because we didn't know any better, but we weren't healthy. I didn't know we weren't healthy. I can look back and, and say we weren't healthy. And for, I guess, eight years, the Lord did an amazing healing work through the the love and care from Pastor Eric and Susan, the love and care from this congregation, the the word of God being spoken into our lives, and we got to a really healthy place. We had really good boundaries on on our lives. And then Crystal got sick at the end of 2015. I'm I'm not blaming, but I'm acknowledging. And we let the enemy dictate our schedule since December of 2015. And those things that were important to us, to our family, We just let go, and we didn't fight for it. And that's my fault. I am not. I'm. I'm not blaming anybody as because I'm a pastor. It has nothing to do with being a pastor. It has to do with we chose not to fight for those things that we needed to fight for. We we 
Crystal got sick. We graduated our first kid. We dropped our, our first kid off at school. We adopted a baby. We, all of the things that took place in our life in the last 18 months began to dictate our schedule. Instead of us saying, no, we're going to honor the Lord. And I came back from those meetings in June, and I realized it's time to start honoring the Lord again. In my marriage, in my family, in my church family. And so before we receive communion, I want to ask you, where, this message is about resting in the Lord. It's specific. This isn't a salvation message. If you haven't given your life to the Lord, now's a great time. You're about to receive the representation of the body that was broken for you and the blood that covered your sins that allows you to have eternal life in heaven. But the message this morning is about what's your home like? And it's, a, it's an honest question. I'm asking you, what is your home like? What is your marriage like? Is the yoke easy? Or can you like not wait till the next time you get away from your spouse? Is the burden light? I believe it's supposed to be. I really do. I believe you should be in love with your spouse and actually like your spouse. I love everybody. I have to. Is your home a place of rest? Or is it a place of unrest? We're going to spend the remaining part of this year really trying to put some things into place in our church body because I want our church body to mimic this. You have to figure out what it's going to look like in your personal family. I'm going to pray and I'm going to ask you maybe the best way to ask it is could there be changes in your home? Should there be changes in your home? And as I pray, I just want you to ask the Lord. It doesn't mean you're living in sin. Listen, this isn't a sin question. This is a, hey, let's just examine and maybe take some things back that the enemy's tried to steal. Because we're talking about the blessing of the Lord. We're not talking about sin here. Lord, you've revealed some pretty significant things in my life things that didn't inhibit my relationship with you when it comes to salvation, but inhibited the blessing of the Lord and my family. And as I have studied this, as I've spent time examining this, I've personally made some changes, but I'm not there yet. Lord, I don't, I don't know that I can confidently say, I really understand what it means to rest in you and to honor the Sabbath or to honor the Lord's day. Or, and I want to. And Lord, as we examine this time, as we spend time in the next few months looking at what it means to be a family individually, husband, wife, kids, parents, siblings, and what it means to be a church family, Lord, my prayer is that we would take active steps to become more like what you've called us to be. Lord, you want to pour out amazing blessing. I really do believe that. And I believe that we can open up the windows of heaven by being obedient to this call to rest in you. I thank you for that, Lord. Amen. So as we prepare to receive communion, as awkward as this is going to be, it's what I feel like I'm supposed to do. If you know you need to change things in your home, would you stand with your communion? Maybe you got it figured out. I don't know. We didn't. I had to make changes. I would be one of the ones standing. I believe as you receive communion today, the Lord's going to begin to birth things in you that will show you and teach you things that you need to change. For those of you that are still sitting, praise the Lord. I'm glad you found boundaries. I'm glad you have, have put these things in place. Honestly, there's no sarcasm in that at all. I want to learn from you. And I mean that honestly. But I also want to stand with those who would say, I need to make some changes. And let's walk this, let's walk this road together. Because I believe when we get to the next place where we can say the yoke is easy and the burden is light, man, that's going to draw our kids. It's going to draw our grandkids. It's going to draw our neighbors, our friends, our family. And we'll, we will be doing the best neighboring we can do. Lord, thank you for the body that is broken for my sins. 
I recognize that you left heaven and you came to earth and you willingly lived a, a, a sinless, a perfect life so that we could step into relationship with you. Your body was broken. It was bruised for my iniquities. You took the stripes on your back for my healing. And I am grateful, Lord. Amen. You can take the bread. Lord, this grape juice represents the blood that you shed to wash away my sins. You washed them away. You, you didn't cover them up. You didn't paint over it. You washed them away. They're gone. Your word declares they're as far as the east is from the west, and I am grateful that I have assurance of my salvation in you. I can't earn it. I can't work hard enough for it. You've just given it as a free gift because of the blood that you shed. Thank you for forgiving me of my sins. Thank you for making a pathway to salvation. In your name I pray, Jesus. Amen. You can receive the juice. For each of you that stood, thank you for being honest. Now we begin to take steps together. For those of you that were sitting, help us. Help us do this. So we're going to go eat lunch in just a second. Pastor Eric, would you, would you come up here for a minute? For those of you who are new to Grace or, or have come in the last five years and maybe you've not met Pastor Eric. Pastor Eric and his wife Susan founded this church 35 years ago. Do you know the actual date? I don't actually know the actual date. It was the first Sunday in September of 82. Of 82, the first Sunday. So I could have done better on a couple of weeks earlier, but I wasn't here, so sorry. Um, By the way, I was only 10 years old at the time. Yeah. <laughs> I got the red mic, Justin. 35 years of being a church family. 35 years of love, acceptance, and forgiveness. That's a pretty big deal. 35 years of this church family growing, changing, evolving, cherishing, loving, most importantly, drawing closer to the Lord. 35 years of lives being changed. And some of you would say you've been here for all 35 years. Some of you have been here for, you know, an hour and 35 minutes. 35 years of water baptisms and baby dedications and healing and most importantly, salvation. And I'm sure as I say that, Eric and Susan, you're, you're seeing faces just run through your mind of all of the lives that have been changed. Today happens to also be the fifth anniversary of Crystal and I being appointed as pastors to carry the torch and to take Grace Community Church and be obedient to what God is calling us to be as the, the armor bearer, I guess, for Grace Community Church moving forward, the shepherd. I've had a privilege of being here for 13 years and leading this family for the last five years. Here's some things I've learned over the last five years that you probably learned way, way before I did. God is faithful. Even when I have no idea how he's going to be faithful, in the current situation I'm in, or whatever the next situation is, he's always been faithful. He's not limited to a box. I can't expect him to do things the same way he did it for Pastor Eric and Susan. I've tried. That doesn't work. I can't expect him to do it the same way he did it for me last time. He's not limited to doing it the same way every time. Although I would prefer that he would because then I could you know, manipulate it and make it happen. I've also learned and continue to learn that as much as I would like, I'm not in charge. God is. And he's responsible for every outcome. I personally have so many dreams and desires and goals for myself, for my family, for this church family. My job, however, is to be obedient and plant and water and trust him for the harvest. And this has become more and more real since I became the pastor here five years ago. I think it's real easy hiding behind you. And I would like to go back sometimes to hiding <laughs> behind you and letting somebody else be out front. Um, There's plenty of room to hide behind <laughs> I, I, I want to say thank you that you took the steps of faith that you took 35 years ago. Uh, you were at a great church in Calvary and uh, you were doing great things there and you took the steps of faith to be obedient to 
plant this church and here we are 35 years later and the faces are different. Some of them are the same, but a lot of them are different. Uh, Certainly leadership, staff is all different than it was. Um, But I can't take credit for this. Uh, And 35 years from now, somebody else is going to be pastoring this church and and they're going to not be able to take credit for 70 years of of pastoring this church and where this church has gone. But I want to say thank you. And I I think we should give the Lord praise and and say thank you to, to Eric and Susan for what they did. I also think it's important to give you a chance to say something uh, uh, and to I, whatever. I don't know what the Lord's laid on your heart, uh, but you're never a man without words. So, <laughs> Well, I could not uh, receive a thank you from you then without saying thank you back to you. Uh, the Lord has been my joy and my joy. And so most of my thoughts uh, need to switch right now at this time to that. Um, but I, I just want to join you in celebrating the faithfulness of God and uh, how unfailing His love is for us. Unfailing. Unfailing. And uh, He keeps us. Aren't you glad He keeps us? Yeah. And uh, these past five years have been uh, very challenging for us, too. Uh, different ways than your five years. But ways in which we have continued to see the Lord show His faithfulness to 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 continue to reveal His Word and His promises to us, and to cause us to uh, come to greater places of rest in Him. <laughs> it's a word for all of us, man, not just for you. And uh, I'm so glad there is such a place as that. Yeah. So it's great to be here on this day, and thank you. Well, I've, I specifically asked if Eric would pray a blessing over this church. Uh, that he was obviously intricately a part of planting and birthing, but also over Crystal and I, and uh, the blessing of the church and a blessing over us as we continue doing what he's asked us to do. And so however you want to do that, Pastor, I want to just turn it over to you for that and and just pray just the Lord's amazing blessing. Well, I think I would like for Crystal to come up and stand with you, and I'd like for Susan to come and stand with Crystal. Paul writes to the church of Colossae and says, For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, for all patience and long-suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. And um, obviously cannot say it any better than Paul said it. Uh, But uh, this is our prayer. And um, I would like to just transparently say, Ben, that... uh, We have been praying for this very thing that God has done in your life. As a matter of fact, yesterday morning as we prayed, Susan prayed, Lord, let them discover that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. So God has just one more time shown up that he is faithful yes and he's there and so i will pray over the church and then we want to pray over you lord jesus you are the head of the church and we may confidently trust in your leadership for you are unfailing and it is still true that you who began a good work will complete it until the day of salvation Not only is it true in our individual lives, but it is true in the church and in your bride, the body of Christ, that you watch over your word to perform it, that your word is forever settled in heaven, 
and that nothing can change what you have declared to be. Lord, I thank you for the birth of this church. I thank you for taking a, a handful of people that really allowed me to be a leader and were patient and gracious and prayerful and saw you establish a work. And you did a good thing, Lord. Because you always do good things. And I thank you. I thank you for those early years. I thank you for the succeeding years of growth and establishment. And I thank you for these years and for the future that you have for this church. Thank you, Lord God, that you continue to do the work of perfecting the saints and establishing uh, a, a point in uh, this earth in which the kingdom is advanced, in which you are glorified, in which our lives are humbled before you, and in which you always get the glory. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you that you are on task, you're not distracted, you're purposeful, you're sovereign, you are accomplishing what you have in your heart for this work, and that we can have every expectation that the latter days will be greater than the former days, according to the word of the Lord. We thank you, Lord, for every life that will be touched by the work of this church in these walls and outside these walls, as you continue to pour out your grace and your peace and your mercy into lives that are desperately in need of your touch. Do it, O oh God, and make this to be a fruitful and abounding place to your glory. And Father, we thank you for being in Crystal, I thank you, Lord, for uh, I thank you for a pastor who is, first of all, passionately in love with you and has given his life to pursue after you, to be a man who can hear your voice and not want to move unless he's heard your voice. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you have given uh, a pastor who not only passionately pursues you, but is madly in love with this woman. And that, Lord, they are a picture of what you intended marriage to be. Thank you for that, Lord God. It's encouraging. It's inspiring. It's healing. And, Lord, it stands out as an example in a very, very broken world. And thank you, Lord God, that he loves his wife. And thank you, Lord, that you have given Ben and Crystal a remarkable family, and that, Lord, that you are even in this day doing new things. And I thank you for that. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord, that you have given Ben a, a desire to be a, a servant that's pleasing to you as he serves this congregation and as he ministers the Word of God, as he leads, as he serves, as he cares, as he pours out his life, and, Lord, gives definition to the reality that greater love has no man than this, but that he would lay down his life for his friends. And Lord, been shown that. And so, Lord, I am praying on this day, as he, uh, as, as he hits this five-year mark, Lord, I know that there is release that is, that is uh, brought about in the heavenlies, that our eyes do not see, but our spirit understands, that there is release that's happened in this time, and that he can uh, not recall the former days because the Lord will do a new thing. And that he can anticipate, oh God, a greater freedom, a greater liberty, a greater grace, a greater eloquence, a greater discernment, a greater understanding and knowledge of the word, and a greater skill in its delivery because of this moment of release that you are bringing. Thank you for it, Lord God. Bless and prosper them. I speak health, 
physically, emotionally, and spiritually over this family. I believe you, Lord God, for blessing and not curse all the days of their lives in Jesus' name, that they will prosper and be in health even as their soul prospers, and they will fulfill your call that when the day comes that they stand before our master, they will hear those words, well done, good and faithful servants. And I speak that and declare it in the name of Jesus. Amen. A prayer coming back today, and I have said this to the staff, and I said this to my wife and my family, is that today we would be standing on the top of a mountain, and that we would drop, we would make a snowball, and we would drop it in the, at, on this mountain, and it would begin to roll and gain momentum and, and synergy, and we would begin to, to move forward in all that God's called us to do. And I'm going to be real honest with you, it takes you coming alongside and stepping into this this wonderful thing that God has in store for us. And so I want to invite you back. Well, I want to invite you to stay for lunch. We're going to go eat lunch in just a second. But I want to invite you back next week and the week after as we begin to really look at what a, a strong family looks like individually and as a church family. And I really want to challenge you. Be back next week. Come and be part and see all that God's going to do in you and through you because I believe he has wonderful things in store for you. All right, are you hungry? Yeah, that preacher went way long. I blame the old preacher. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I learned from him. Uh, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go out this door right here. Uh, this is for the sake of a flow. So we're going to go out this door right here. Uh,